Today we're going to discuss three types of mass analyzers that are commonly used for mass spectrometry. We'll discuss the time of flight, the quadrupole, and what's called an ion trap, at least one type of ion trap. And it turns out that there are several types of mass analyzers. And as a reminder, the mass analyzer, the entire goal of it is to be able to separate charged gaseous ions according to their mass over charge ratio. Okay. All right. And so when Fortunately, we have many choices, as you can see here, and when designing an instrument, the mass analyzers can actually be mixed and matched with different ionization sources in order to make an instrument uh, that, that really works for your analyte and sample type. And we tend to lean towards lower resolution mass analyzers unless we have a reason to need high resolution. Um, and so what we'll see is, for example, in many introductory courses or, uh, or, or even um, low need industrial labs, uh, they won't use the high accuracy instruments unless they're really trying to identify uh, very small differences between molecules. Okay, so unless you need it for identification. All right, so let's get started by talking about the time of flight mass analyzer. Okay, and if you've heard anything about mass spec before, this is likely the first uh, mass analyzer that you've been taught, and you may even have thought this was all of what there is to mass spec. Um, so this is basically the simplest type of analyzer that you can imagine. Uh, you have your ionization source, which we've already learned several types of those that could be uh, electron ionization or, or chemical ionization. All right, and so that's going to be using uh, various sets of electromagnetic fields to send ions into the next stage of the instrument, which is the mass analyzer, all right? So now here's where we're gonna talk about the time of flight. All right, so the time of flight will be over here, okay? And so basically what we have is essentially what you could consider a drift tube a long tube, often a cylinder, usually in a linear pattern, although uh, nowadays, sometimes to save space in the instrument, it's curved around itself um, as a way to get more length without taking up more physical space. Um, and we're talking here anywhere from uh, 0.5 to two meters long. So this can be pretty long. Um, and the idea is that ions of varying size and or charge will come in uh, from the ionization source, potentially all at the same time, okay? And so we might end up with, say, a large molecule, a high molecular weight, and a small one, okay? Um, and then these are going to be accelerated through the tube by applying uh, an, an electric field across the tube, okay? So we're gonna apply an electric field across the tube, a voltage, um, and we can actually then define the kinetic energy that is applied across the, uh, that is applied to the, the molecules as they move through the tube in terms of the voltage that's applied, okay? So our kinetic energy is equal to the charge of the ion, times the charge of an electron times the voltage, all right? Um, that electron charge is a constant, um, and that's, I'll write it out for you here. There's 10 to the 19 coulombs. And again, Z uh, is just the charge. So if you have a, a molecule that is carrying one uh, extra charge than that, then Z would be equal to one. Um, and so then we can we know what voltage we're applying. And so this means all the molecules that have the same charge will have the same kinetic energy. 
all right? So for this, it doesn't matter what their mass is, they're all gonna receive the same kinetic energy from being from going through this potential, all right? So they pick up a kinetic energy here as a function of charge. But then we know from basic physics that the kinetic energy of motion is equal to one half times the mass times the velocity squared. So note this is little v for velocity and up here it was big V for voltage. All right. And so what that means is uh, we're going to have all the molecules accelerated the same and therefore having the same kinetic energy, but molecules of different mass will move with different velocities. And so you can ask yourself, will the larger ion arrive earlier or arrive later at the end of the tube where we're going to place a detector? Okay, so you can pause the video and think about that. Will the larger ion arrive earlier or arrive later? All right, and so what we see in fact is that the larger ions arrive later and that's because here for a given kinetic energy, the mass term is larger, so the velocity term must be correspondingly smaller. And so we get the, the smaller uh, species moving faster. And if we had one that was even smaller, you know, it would go even faster. Okay, and so and basically these end up separating in space across the tube so that the smallest ions arrive first, okay? For the same charge. All right, and so this is the simplest conceptual way to separate uh, charged ions by their mass to charge ratio. And this has a number of advantages, okay? Um, in that uh, it can provide very high mass resolution because any small change in mass will give you a squared uh, or a quadratic change in the velocity. And so we really can tell small differences, okay? This is also pretty rugged in that uh, there's not a lot of fancy changes to the electromagnetic field over time. Um, and so um, it's just um, unlikely to break. Um, you can go up as high as you want in terms of the size of molecule that you're going to analyze. It'll just move slower and slower through the tube. Um, and so there's no upper limit, unlike some of the other methods we're gonna see later. Um, and we can also acquire data rapidly, okay? So that's a series of, of things. Now, the disadvantage is this tends to be um, a little more expensive. Um, and, and that's because, okay. Uh, we have to be able to maintain a very uh, low pressure in here. This is all under uh, what we would call high vacuum so that those molecules can move through the tube without colliding with anything. So we need really good vacuum pumps uh, to be able to keep this going and that, that dries up the cost of the instrument. All right, now let's move on. That's it for time of flight. Uh, for what we need to know. So the next one is what we call a quadrupole. And this is a little bit more complicated. Okay, so unlike the mass analyzer in which every molecule that goes in comes out the other side eventually, the quadrupole is actually a mass filter. So only certain molecules will make it out. You might ask yourself, what happens to the rest of them? So let's see, okay. So here, instead of sending uh, um, charged ions in through a long tube and letting them fly according to their mass over charge ratio, now we're gonna selectively let only certain ones through. Okay, so we often draw this uh, either in cross section or at an angle, and that's because it consists of four, four charged rods. You can kind of see me trying to draw them in, 
an angled 3D here, okay? Um, and then these have alternating opposing charges. So we can charge, say the top and bottom positive, and then these two will be negative. Okay, and so the ions would be coming in down the center of this tube coming from this direction. All right, so that's this over here is the ion source. Okay, coming from the ion source over here. All right, and then we're going to put the detector at the back end. So any ions that make it through the tube to the detector are the ones that we will be able to see. All right, but they don't all make it through. Why not? Okay, and so what we do here is we apply a potential across the different rods. Okay, so that we have two positive, two negative, and then we switch it. And now the other two are positive and the other two are negative. Okay. Okay, um, so we switch over time. Okay, and this creates an electric field that makes the ions oscillate as they go down that space between the rods. Okay. And so um, if we draw the path of one of these, ions, an ion that makes it through, meaning that it's oscillating with just the right frequency that it never crashes into a wall, is going to essentially cycle down the middle of the tubes straight into the detector. And my detector was a little off, so I had to bend my curve. But so there's our, you know, and so it's hitting. But what happens to molecules whose uh, frequency of oscillation isn't just right and it oscillates say too far out so it picks up too much momentum and it goes too far out it's actually going to crash into the wall so some ions never make it because they they pick up too much momentum from that electric field and they they crash and then that's it for them um, they don't come out they stick okay and so ones that are too heavy or too light will oscillate into the wall and get lost So we lose them to sticking to the rods. Okay. At least this is how we can think about it at an introductory level. <laughs> All right. Um, and so what the what's nice about this is we can actually control the frequency of oscillation and the amplitude so that we know what m over z will make it through. Okay. So we can then tune this so that only one M over Z makes it through at a time. And then how would you collect a mass spectrum, which tells you the contents of your sample at a variety of M over Zs? Well, you would have to tune the frequencies at which you're oscillating. Okay. So that different M over Zs make it through over time. All right, so that's why we call this a filter because only one M over Z molecule makes it through at a time, okay? It turns out, even though this is um, perhaps more conceptually complicated, it's actually less expensive because it doesn't require as, uh, as high of a vacuum pull in order to maintain it. Okay, um, but it has some limits on the mass range, okay? Why do you think that that would be? So what I mean by that is that there is an upper limit on how big of a molecule we can detect with this, okay? About three or maybe 4,000 grams per mole is usually all that we can detect with this, okay? Um, if it's bigger than that, we need to choose a different type of mass analyzer. And you can ask why that might be. 
Um, and and it's because we can only tune so far. So basically, if a if a molecule is just too big, it's always going to get um, it's always going to be out of frequency, and we just won't be able to get it through uh, your typical analyzer. Okay. Um, and similarly, this tends to be fairly uh, low resolution. So in terms of distinguishing different masses, because it's hard to be able to say, well, you know, if, if, if a particular M over Z is getting through, you know, is a 1% change in mass really going to make that big of a difference in whether it gets through and reaches the detector? Probably not. And so we, we can't necessarily distinguish with the fine gradations that we could in the time of flight, okay, because it's hard to tune so finely. All right, so that's it for the quadruple. And we can check one more, learn about one more, and that's called the ion trap. And this has a variety of names, actually. Um, sometimes we call it the Paul ion trap after one of the inventors. Sometimes it's actually called a quadrupole ion trap. But I don't want that to confuse you because it's not the same mechanism of separation at all um, as the quadrupole that we just learned about. It's only called that because it still has four rods, um, but it's not at all this idea of things moving down a path, okay? So I like to call it the Paul ion trap to avoid confusion, okay? But this is similarly a mass filter, okay? So only certain masses will reach the detector at a time, okay? All right, so if we have to draw one of these, um, it similarly has four segments, but instead of it being linear, like we had with our quadrupole here, where you have four linear rods and you shoot down the middle, here we actually end up with this um, sort of difficult to draw tubular shape, kind of like a donut. Okay. Here's my donut, I guess. Um, and then it has a cap on the top and one on the bottom as well. Okay. Um, which is sometimes also maybe even another donut, okay? But we usually draw this in cross-section. So in cross-section, we, we just draw the edges of each of the four parts of the charge tubes, all right? And so we end up with this space in between them uh, in three dimensions, like a little cave, okay? And so the ion source, we send in ions from the source, okay? And then they accumulate in this ion trap. Okay. Now, ions are going to be moving really fast, accelerated out of the ion source, right? And we need them to all of a sudden stop and hold still inside of this trap for a while until we're actually going to shoot them out one by one as a function of M over Z. Okay. And so how do you get them to slow down when they're moving in really fast? You could ask yourself that. Okay. And it turns out we actually fill this up with a low pressure of bath gas. Okay, so to slow down uh, the ions as they enter the trap, okay, we call it bath gas, some kind of inert gas. Um, and why does that help? Think about for a second. Okay. Okay, this is because it's going to slow down those ions through collisions. All right, so they're going to lose energy to collision. All right, so the perk of this, of course, is that now, again, we don't have to pull as strong of a vacuum because uh, we actually have this bath gas. Okay, and so here we're going to use electric and magnetic fields to define uh, which which ions get held in state in the stable orbit inside of this trap and so they end up just oscillating around inside and hopefully not hitting the walls okay so we're going to use these fields okay so now, the idea is we are going to be able to release them one by one by destabilizing. Okay, so we trap them all and then we destabilize them one by one.
we'll just do that. Okay, and then it gets shot out to the detector. All right. And so we just tune our voltage that we're holding across this and we slowly destabilize each M over Z sequentially, okay? So we scan the voltage to be able to release the different M over Z and get a spectrum, all right? So you can ask yourself, what would be the advantages of this? Okay, well, I already told you um, it, it doesn't require low vacuum. In fact, we're pumping in a, a small amount of bath gas. So again, it's gonna be inexpensive because it doesn't require that fancy vacuum. Okay. It's also, again, rugged and compact. This one is compact because it's just this uh, compact cage where we're holding the ions. It doesn't require a two meter long tube, nor does it require the length of the quadrupole tubes for, for ions to move down. Um, and so this is just a, a tiny little thing that can easily fit inside of a small instrument. Um, and so these are very oftenly found um, in, in undergraduate labs. And so later, if you take analytical chemistry in the spring, uh, you might end up using one of these. Okay. All right, now what are some disadvantages? Similarly to the quadrupole that we discussed above, you might expect this will also have low resolution because you know we can only destabilize with so much specificity. Okay. All right. One thing to note about the, the ion trap is we only store uh, the ions for a limited period of time. Um, and if you try to hold them, uh, if you try to hold too much ions at once, you're gonna run out of space. So there's actually uh, a limit on how much sample can be processed at a time. All right, so the limit on sample size in terms of uh, how, how many molecules at a time. All right, so from here, uh, you are now familiar with three representative types of mass analyzers, certainly not the only types. Um, you'll see others out there, uh, but you've seen the time of flight where we separate by kinetic energy, the quadrupole and the ion trap where we only let through one M over Z at a time to the detector, either by stabilizing their path through uh, a small gap between cylindrical rods or by destabilizing them one by one, okay? All right, so that's it for today. Thank you for listening.